everyone and welcome to Beyond Focus TV. My name is Angie Daniel and I'm the hostess of the show. On tonight's show we have with us the District Attorney of Brooklyn Kings, Mr. Charles Hines. We're going to take a short break. When we come back I'll introduce him to you. Mm Welcome back. Before we took the break, I did tell you I will introduce to you the district attorney, Mr. Charles Hines. He is a six-term district attorney of Kings. He's up for re-election. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure, really, because I what I wanted to do is to have um, an idea of who you are, mm -hmm. your background, um, and how you get it so involved in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the person behind the whole thing. Well, <coughs> I was... I graduated from St. John's University and its law school uh, in 63 from the yes. law school. I started my career as, a, as an associate attorney in the legal aid societies in the criminal division. Mm -hmm. uh, I was recruited to join the Brooklyn DA's office in the uh, end of uh, 1969 and I, I worked there for six years. I was promoted to confidential assistant to the DA handling serious felony trials. And I became the chief of the Rackets Bureau, and I was then promoted to first assistant. I was then uh, recruited by the then Governor Hugh Carey and Attorney General Louis Lefkowitz to investigate and prosecute nursing home fraud mm -hmm. in New York State, which was a serious problem in yes. 1975. 1980, I was uh, recruited by Ed Koch uh, <laughs> to become his fire commissioner. Okay. And then after a couple of years there, I went uh, back into, I went into private practice. I spent a couple of years in private practice. I was then recruited by Governor Mario Cuomo oh. to become the corruption prosecutor for New York State. And then in that job, um, I had the, uh, the obligation to prosecute the tragedy of Michael Griffith, who was nice. killed in the, the Howard Beach section mm -hmm. of Queens County in 1986. I, was convict I convicted three uh, white racists and sent them to jail for a very, very long period of time. Uh, as a result of that, really, the, uh, the notoriety I, I received, mm -hmm. I was elected Brooklyn District Attorney in 1989. Okay. And I've had, uh, I've been, I'm coming on to my 24th year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm born and bred Brooklynite. I'm yes. married <coughs> to a former trauma nurse. We had five children and we have 16 grandchildren. And we live in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn now. Wow. Yeah. How does it feel? Because I, I, while reading your story and the idea of you were born and raised in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and now you're representing, you represent the Kings, everything that you know is right here. How does that make you feel? Well, I love Brooklyn. I love the diversity of Brooklyn. And Brooklyn has always been diverse. Brooklyn, because of the, uh, the connection to mm -hmm. <coughs> Ellis Island, at the uh, the turn of the the 20th century, um, had the uh, the spillover from from the folks who were living in who first arrived in Manhattan, mm -hmm. so uh, the immigrant population of Europe settled in Brooklyn for the most part. Yes. You know, one seventh of the United States traces its roots to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooklyn has become uh, diverse in different ways. Uh, people of color dramatically yes. filling up mm -hmm. uh, the county. Immigrants. 
uh, people from the Caribbean, p yes. people from you know uh, from Latino countries. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, uh, the the Pakistani uh, uh, explosion on Coney Island, Coney Island Avenue. Avenue, Russian the Russian immigrants. Uh, mm -hmm. So I mean, th to me, Brooklyn has a, a special meaning because representing the diverse population and being sensitive to each and every cultural group yes. is the thing I'm most proud of. And what I've tried to do to maintain that is to have an exceptional community relations bureau, people who are uh, just do an extraordinary job acting as the eyes and ears mm -hmm. of the office. So uh, Brooklyn is my place. Yes, it is. One of the things that I, I ha wanted to talk to you about, because I know you've covered so many different grounds, mm -hmm. um, you've, you, you're extremely sensitive when it comes to violence. Mm -hmm. um, Dom domestic violence. Mm -hmm. You have this whole program of reaching out to women who've been abused. Right. Um, I want to kind of have a connection between that and women that are in prison, mm -hmm. which is two things that you are very passionate about. Right. So can you make a little correlation for us? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I grew up in a nightmare of domestic violence. I watched my mother beaten when I was a child, and it, it, it uh, continued until I was old enough and strong enough to stop it. My mother was a, a real estate broker at a time when women uh, were not welcome in the, in the workplace. And so during the day, she would be disre disrespected typically by uh, male lawyers, and then she'd come home at night and have to duck punches for, for my father who was an alcoholic. So, you know, I, you, you learn an awful lot about the inner strength of women from that experience. And my mother was a very strong person but a very soft person, a yeah. person who really cared about me, uh, had the good uh, wisdom to uh, have me counseled uh, yeah. when I was growing up because one of the problems with kids growing up in that, in that environment is they feel the same fury and anger mm -hmm. and frustration I felt and they, they lash out unless they're counseled. Um, people look around at my office, the majority of the assistant district attorneys are women, the majority of okay. the executives are women. I have promoted women everywhere I've been. I promoted the first deputy fire commissioner, female deputy fire, fire commissioner in the history of the New York City Fire Department. Uh, everywhere I've been, I've, I've promoted women because I, know, I knew the experience my mother had and how she had to fight her way uh, mm -hmm. through the, uh, the insensitivity and, and the, uh, the gender bias. Okay. So, uh, you know, looking at domestic violence from my perspective today, I'm very, very proud to say that before 1990, virtually no prosecutor in this country exactly. cared about domestic violence. Yes. Today, every prosecutor has some resources. We have in Brooklyn uh, the most comprehensive program for domestic violence victims and their surviving children. It's Survivor, called the yes. Family Justice Center. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of the fact that Mayor Bloomberg and I, who opened up the, the center in 2007, um, managed to get every possible resource for those victims and their kids. And I'm, I'm also very proud that the mayor uh, dedicated that uh, center to Regina Catherine Drew, who is my mother. And, oh. and uh, you know, I always will appreciate and remember him for that. Um, in terms of women in, in prison, yes, um, this is a, this huge outbreak. It's, of it's, it's a it's women a very it's a very serious problem. And uh, you know what we have tried to do. Uh, is uh, uh, approach it on two different levels. Mm -hmm. For example, I have a drug treatment alternative to prison. Yes. And we have men and women okay. uh, in that program as an alternative. You know, they go into residential drug yes. treatment. And they then that's they, a really huge program that you're pushing. Um, yeah. I, I want to talk about that in, yeah. in its specifically yeah. I, I just, I'm yeah. just touching on it. Mm -hmm. But in that program, we can't. the children can't go to a rehab. Yes. Well, we started something called Drew House, again, mm -hmm. named in my mother's memory, where we have five families of mothers and their kids living in a, uh, in a multi, mm -hmm. uh, multiple dwelling in Crown Heights. Um, that program allows women to stay with their children, to go out and work during the day, to nurture those children at night, because I recognize the, the incredible, irreversible trauma mm -hmm. visited on a child who sees their mother go off to prison. Now, unfortunately, how, because, regardless of the success involved, it was academically mm -hmm. validated by the Columbia School of Nursing as reducing re reoffending rates by half, 
being infinitely cheaper. I mean, infinitely yes. cheaper. Yes. $29,000 $29, for a mom and two kids in that program. If you took the two kids and put them in foster care and put mom in prison, and it's $134,000. Okay. I have not been able to get resources from government to expand it. So I'm very, very happy about a uh, collaboration that the Women's Prison Association mm -hmm. and I will begin uh, on, on Wednesday of, of this week. Okay. We will have 45 mothers uh, being able to stay home with their children mm -hmm. or go to work, and they'll be monitored very, very closely by uh, uh, case managers. And so those 45 moms will be uh, save the, uh, the, uh, the horror of going, to, of going jail, to jail. And those, the children of those moms will not experience that not trauma. Not having their parents. So I have two questions um, within, within that statement that you mm -hmm. just made, but we need to take a short break. When we come back, I'll ask you that question. Okay, good enough. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Beyond Focus TV. We were just on a break. If you're just turning on, we are here with the district attorney, Charles Hines of Kings, having this great conversation about how we can make a transition. Instead of sending women to prison, we'll send them to, like, it's some sort of a safe way house, right? Would, well, would we, it be in we, the same term? We have, we have a safe house, the, mm -hmm. the apartment, and we really cannot get the resources to duplicate it, unfortunately. Okay. And so, working with the Women's Prison Association, we, Prisoners Association, we came up with this great idea. All right, if, if we can't afford to put them in uh, this uh, multiple dwelling that we yes. have, why not let them stay home? Why so they just stay at home? They stay home, they can work as well. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it's, it allows them to have a normal life, mm -hmm. but knowing full well that they are under mandate because they have okay. to plead guilty. So they'll guilty. still be in probation? Yeah, they have to plead guilty okay. up front. And they are, they are, are, are managed very, very carefully by okay. professional social workers. Okay. And as they, they, uh, they finish their term... Because I was going to uh, ask you about that. Is there a time limit for yeah, it? They, they, they'll, they'll get a term maybe a year. Mm -hmm. they, they could get two years. But at the end of that time, the, the, uh, the plea of guilty will be set aside. Mm -hmm. The case will be dismissed and the okay. file sealed. So if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're asked in the future, have you ever been convicted of a crime? The answer you is have no. A, the answer is no. Yeah. Because so you have a I think this has great potential. It's very, very it's cost effective, obviously, because the mm -hmm. cost of putting a woman in, in jail is sixty four thousand yeah. dollars. But as, I have a quick question yeah, within that. Sure. Is there specific like is it first probation or um, first time offender, or do you have to have a specific crime that you've been taught? Because, you know, I don't want people to just think, like, okay, you can just go. My, my role is to say, mm -hmm. I got 45 women okay. that, I will, that I will I will allow to stay home or mm -hmm. you know, go to work and, and be with their kids. The, the, the people who uh, refer the cases to me, okay. they will set the criteria. Okay. And, they, and they are social service uh, professionals. Okay. And they'll also administer the program with with uh, random visits, with uh, yes. uh, alcohol and drug testing. Okay. You know, okay. So it's it'll be a very, very controlled environment, except that they'll be living at home, at home. they'll be allowed to work. And, and the, the greatest thing is, you know, seeing mom and the kids at home at night over dinner. Exactly. Not only that, you, you're, saving, like, you're saving finance for, oh. for the city in itself. The parents get to stay home and raise their kids. And, and sometimes people just need a little step back so they'll be able to, you know, move on. Like learning that I've made a mistake. This, is, this was my, you know what, I can do better. I'm going to do better because this is what happened. I could have lost my family. And, and, and also, what it helps me is to make people understand how we've redefined the office of a public prosecutor. Yes. The easy thing I, I do is put people in jail. The real tough uh, uh, thing for me to do is to try and find prevention mm -hmm. program, intervention program. That's why I'm so proud of all the things we've done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is that you don't get public safety by building warehouses of despair. You get public safety by reducing reoffending rates. Yes. And that's how Brooklyn has gone from the fifth most violent place, place in America to yes. one of the ten best places to live, to live in America. In 
talking about that, um, you have a program, the, the treatment alternatives for duly diagnosed patients. Mm -hmm. Can we, um, prisoners, can we talk about the DTAP and TAD? How are they different? Well, the, the different kinds of, of addictions, really. You know, mm -hmm. One is drug addiction, and one is drug addiction where someone is also have serious problems with uh, mental health. Okay. You know, we started the first mental health court in Brooklyn, in the city. I'm sorry, in the whole state. Okay. Uh, there are now mental health courts popping up all over the state. Mm -hmm. And, and we, were be, we were able to, to, to uh, provide the resources for that by working with the, the duly diagnosed. So people who have drug addiction and they have yes. mental health okay. issues. But at the end of the programs, you've got the same kind of result. You have people whose cases are dismissed and the mm -hmm. file is sealed. Mm. So it's the same thing as like as the yeah. program. program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we you run those two programs alternately. Mm -hmm. We have also the young women program because, I mean, it's amazing to me how how many different programs that you mm -hmm. have running just so you could eliminate people going to jail. Yeah. You have the youth program. Right. You have the the studying program. You have women program. You right. have nonviolence program yeah. that people can use instead of like. You know, trying to say, you're not saying, like, okay, everybody's going to go to jail because you committed this crime, and then you, go to, you give them be a chance. Be because it never worked. It never worked putting people in jail. And all you do is you, you uh, violently disrupt families. And mm -hmm. no one has really understood that. Maybe you have to grow up in a, in a violent environment, as I did, to understand it. Mm -hmm. But the, the incredible uh, dysfunction that's caused to a family when mom or dad or both go to jail and the kid goes off to foster care or, or ends up in grandma's house, mm -hmm. it's something that you may never reverse. And those children, because of their anger, will, will lash out and hurt people. Mm -hmm. And they become part of the criminal justice system. So by, by children understanding that, and you, and you hope they understand that, it's the prosecutor who kept mom at home, that maybe okay. they'll have a different understanding of what we do. Okay. so. We can change that. We can change the environment that the kids are mm -hmm. in by educating, we'll yes. say, the community in itself, right? Absolutely. You know, getting Absolutely. them to know, like, okay, we can, we could do this. This is what the, all of these programs are available. Is just how, how can we use it to a yeah. benefit? How yeah. can people who are first-time offenders mm -hmm. understand? Okay, this is like I didn't like. I know there's criteria and limits. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't want to talk about them, right. you know, unless you want to bring them well, up. No, pe people, I think, no, no pretty much, mm -hmm. the people in Brooklyn, <laughs> that, that I'm the first district attorney to in the country to have residential drug treatment. I'm the first district attorney in the country to have a reentry program for the formerly incarcerated. We are the first in so many ways, first domestic violence court, first major domestic violence bureau. Every expansion... Every trailblazing change has mm -hmm. come from the office of the Brooklyn District yes. Attorney. And I'm so proud of it because, again, our office reflects the public. Yes, you know? we do. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a huge question um, to, well, actually, a huge subject that I want to talk to you about. Sure. I think that your office is making an awesome change with that. But I need to take a break first. Sure. <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about right. it. We're going to take Perfect. a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Beyond Focus TV. We are here with the District Attorney, Mr. Charles Hines. We are talking about different aspects of what we are doing in Kings, uh, Kings County to make Brooklyn a better place to be. Uh, we've talked about alternative places for parents, for imprisonment. Now, one of the things that I know your office is really huge on doing is the Buy Arms Back. Right. Can you tell the community what that is and sure. when it is happening? <clears throat> We decided in 2008, as a result of my clergy liaison to the Brooklyn community, Reverend Joe Jones, uh, and we have the only clergy liaison in the state in the DA's office, 
that it would be more comfortable for someone to go to a church to turn in a gun and get a card mm. worth two hundred dollars, and uh, Commissioner Kelly and I split that, a hundred bucks each, and we began in two thousand eight, and um, we have over the years uh, recovered twenty seven hundred and fourteen guns off the streets of Brooklyn, mm. but in addition, my colleagues, the other four DAs, have replicated the church buyback program, yes. and according to the NYPD, we've taken over eleven thousand guns off the streets of New York City. Over eleven thousand. Yes, ma'am. And uh -huh. and beginning the next gun buyback program will be at the Gospel Assembly, uh, Sister Connie's Church in Coney Island, uh, on Surf Avenue in okay. June. I don't know the date offhand, okay. but uh, we we can supply it for you for your yes, uh, program. Yes, definitely. So we're very excited. We we believe that, I mean, I believe personally we should have a gun buyback program every three weeks. And it would probably would work because yeah. um, right now we are facing a crisis mm -hmm. in, in New York, especially in Brooklyn, where everyone have a gun. Yeah. Everyone, you know, you're eligible to, to be able to carry a gun, but we've been affected by it. Like yeah. family members are being affected sure. by it. Kids are being affected by it. If we have a way that we can transit that, change the whole mm -hmm. aspect of you don't need a gun to protect yourself. Yeah, look, look, we, we, we have a murder rate that dropped from 760 a year in 1990 to under 150 mm -hmm. uh, since 1960, first time. But 75% of those murders are gun-related. So, of course, it's my passion to try and get every damn gun off the street, yes. excuse me, because it, it's, it's, it, it worries me so much that someone tomorrow morning is going to kill some four-year-old child. Right. And every way we can to get these guns off in a reasonable way, way like yes. under the, uh, and using the Constitution, we got to do it. Talking about passion, I know you're extremely passionate. You have a documentary coming up. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we, we were approached by uh, CBS Network yes. News uh, a couple of months ago, and they they said that, uh, and the person involved was a major executive in CBS mm -hmm. News. Her name is Susan Sarinsky. Her uh, uh, life was portrayed by Holly Hunter on Network, mm -hmm. the movie. Yes. And she said, we've done the research. You have the most progressive DA's office in the country. We think people want to see something different in law and order. You know, you've got all of these alternative programs. And exactly. would you let us do it? And I said, sure. I think it's a great idea. So it, it, the, the first, the premiere is May 28th, which happens to be my birthday. Oh, my god! And parents. then it's six, it's five consecutive weeks mm -hmm. for a total of six hours. Okay. Yeah. So, do you need uh, an extra? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no, there's no money for us, you know. Well, yeah. you know, it's good to be on TV at all times. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, though, yeah. I think besides the the fact that you get to portray your office, people mm -hmm. get to understand what why is it working and yeah. what what's working. Sure, and it'll showcase the incredible work that the women and men in my office do yeah. in a non-traditional way. Mm. It's extremely in interesting. Yeah. I think a lot of people are looking forward to it. Um, I, I know one of the things that I believe in is that there's always room to improve. There's always room to grow. No, no question. Yeah, but you can always learn from mm -hmm. your surrounding. No question. And, and being able to see that, it's, it kind of changes the whole aspect of what we see on TV. That's number one. Yes. And two weeks ago, I had no idea that on Wednesday of this week we'd be announcing the 45 women. Women you know, staying home. Someone came up with that idea and it's been working. And it's working. And it's, you know, that's the wonder of this office, that we we do things so differently and there's, oh, I've never met a new idea that I wouldn't review. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. So I want to play a little games with, with sure. you. Um, it's, it's, it's really not a game, but it's just getting your opinion on certain things. Right. right now we have this whole stop and frisk that's happening all over New York. Mm -hmm. um, advice to the young people of Brooklyn as their DA, what would you say to them? If you stopped, be, be respectful, be, you know, be uh, accepting. Uh, you don't have to like it, but, you know, don't show that. I think that there have been changes made. Uh, I, I, don't, I think finally it was very, very clear to the police commission that you could, could not continue to have hundreds of thousands of kids, mostly kids of color, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stopped and, and with not as many guns as people would have expected. So he's what he's done is issued a pro protocol, which is in keeping with the traditional stop and frisk. Okay. When you have a reasonable suspicion that mm -hmm. someone might be doing something wrong, you can stop them, and then you question them. And during that questioning, if you get the impression by something that 
you may be in danger, then you can frisk. But okay. you, you've got to do it in a careful way. Now, every police officer under the new protocol must write down in their report in a very clear way what led them to stop a young mm. person, what led them during the conversation to be raised up in, in order to search. I think that's gonna, going to reduce the numbers of, of stop and frisk uh, dramatically, and I and I think you know you, you you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, and you know I think that that the commissioner has recognized there had to be changes. Okay, very very interesting. I actually didn't know about this part because this whole stop and frisk is really huge in Brooklyn, and then you know Which we have young whole, people just walking around. The whole city around. is, is yes. huge. Yes. Um, the second part of my wanting to pick your brain is as a Brooklynite. I know you're running for you going for re-election. Mm -hmm. Where do you see Brooklyn in the next six years? Well, if the people rehire me, I see uh, a couple of things. First of all, the Red Hook Community Court is yes. one of the most important things we did. In 2000, when we opened Red Hook uh, as a community court. Red Hook was still a very, very dangerous place. As a matter of fact, you go back 15 years, and Red Hook was, was a place you didn't go near unless yes. you had a platoon of Marines, you know. <laughs> that today, is so today, true. Today it's one of the five safest places. Yes. The next community justice center is going to, where community, community uh, uh, justice center is going to be in Brownsville. Mm -hmm. We have on the, uh, the, the drawing board East New York and East Flappish as a possibility. Now, what I want to be able to show is that the miracle of Red Hook, as we call it, will be the miracle of Brownsville. And Brownsville, by the way, is going to be up and running in two years. Mm. And I believe I can make the case to the mayor and to the city council and to the court system that the decision 60 years ago to centralize the court system was a dumb decision because it took the credibility that was in the neighborhoods with like local that. courts downtown, mm -hmm. and for years people didn't trust the system. Okay. People in Red Oak trust the system. People in Brownsville are going to trust exactly. the system. And, and by... The people of this county and this city deserve to have justice back in their neighborhoods, and that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight for. We only can give a thousand people coming home from prison the resources that that make them, uh, that give them rehabilitation. Two thousand other people coming home from prison, mm -hmm. we can't give the resources to because we don't have the money. What I'm going to do is find the money. So, all three thousand. That's what we get every year. Are going to mm -hmm. get it, and and then you're going to see significant levels, uh, increases in public safety. Oh, That's what we're going to do. So I could see six years from now, people yeah. would have they they're going to be fighting to walk the the street yeah. of Brooklyn. They won't Just be able to afford to buy anywhere in Brooklyn. I, I, right now, we can't <laughs> afford to buy anywhere in Brooklyn. Yeah. But you know, with the means, and then we have so many different ways that we are trying to to make Brooklyn better. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is having you as a district attorney. Oh, thank you. Um, no, you, you're doing incredible work, incredible work with, within Brooklyn, and getting people to trust and understand that, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. really huge. So uh, this is the end of our show. Um, you know, we could continue this conversation. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time left. Last word to the community. Uh, I'd like people to, to reflect on what we've been doing and to see how it has had a, had a positive effect on the public safety levels of Brooklyn not by locking every third person up, but by having, a, having programs, 30 of them, mm. that reduce reoffending rates and give, give people a chance and give them a break. And having reviewed all that, I hope they'll remember me on September 10th because that's yes. primary day. Yes. We, we, will, we need to talk about it a little that's bit more, but okay. September 10th. Well, thank you, sir, for thank coming. Thank you so much for having Anytime. me. I really appreciate Anytime. it. Anytime. Anytime. This is, great. This is, this is your home. Good. This is the end of our show. I hope you enjoyed it. I've learned a whole lot. Hope you did too. I will see you next Tuesday, same place, same time. Bye bye. Good. Okay. I hope you can.